Over the last half a decade, we've begun to see each one of the Primarchs begin to return to the Warhammer 40k setting. This is a massive deal, as they are arguably the most important characters in the story next to the God Emperor himself. At first, this started off relatively slow. We got another Primarch every one to two years. But with Engron and Lionel Johnson releasing within a four month window, it seems like Games Workshop is ready to exponentially increase this process. We know that a lot of these Primarchs are just missing in action, and we've only gotten small tidbits about what they've been up to. So Games Workshop can realistically just bring them back at any moment. But what about the Primarchs that we know for sure are dead? Is it possible we could see them return as well? Is death really the end for a being such as a Primarch? Well, today we're gonna get to the bottom of that and a whole lot more. But first a quick shout out to this video's sponsor, then we're gonna dive headfirst into the grimdark. If you're anything like me, then you spend all day working in front of a computer screen just to come home and game in front of another one. Now don't get me wrong, I love that setup, I wouldn't change it for anything. But there's one small problem with it, and that's blue light. You're getting exposed to it constantly from all of the different screens in your life, and that blue light is the common culprit behind eye strain, itchy eyes, headaches, and especially in my own personal experience, difficulty falling asleep. I've been fighting a constant battle against insomnia for the last two decades, and no matter what I tried, nothing seemed to help. Thankfully, everything turned around when GMG Performance sent me a pair of their blue light blocking glasses. They made a world of difference, and I haven't slept better in years. But more importantly, they allowed me to keep my late night gaming habits. And that's because they act as a shield against blue light, helping to reduce eye strain, improve concentration, encourage the reflexes in our eyes, maintain the quality of our vision over for the long term, and most importantly, allow you to actually get a full night's sleep and better quality sleep. I actually have two separate pairs of these. I'm wearing the Optimizer model right now because I think it's a little bit more stylish, but the Oranos model here as well also looks pretty cool. It really just comes down to personal taste. So if you want to give your eyes a break, maintain your vision over the long term, and get a better night's sleep, then for the next 48 hours, GMG Performance is offering a massive 40% discount on all of their amazing glasses. That's almost half off, and like I said, the deal's only going to last for 48 hours, so click on the link in the description of this video and get yourself a pair before it's over. Okay, back to the grimdark. Out of the 20 Primarchs that the Emperor created, 5 of them are confirmed to be dead. Amongst the deceased, we have Ferris Manus, who was decapitated by Fulgrim at the Dropsite Massacre, Sanguinius, who was murdered by Horus at the Siege of Terra, Warmaster Horus himself, who was killed by the Emperor, Conrad Kurz, who allowed himself to be assassinated in order to make a point, and Alpharius, who was killed by Rogel Dorn. The death of each one of these Primarchs is well documented, and we know that they're not just missing in action, they're definitely dead. But is death really the end for a being such as a Primarch, and if not, is it possible for these deceased legends to return to the setting? If so, how could this possibly happen? Well, there are a lot of different methods that already exist within Universe that we're going to be examining today, but the most obvious and well-documented method of bringing them back would be that of cloning. Cloning the Primarchs is not a wild new idea, it's happened multiple times in the past, and most prominently with the character Fabius Bile. As far back as the Horus Heresy, he had been experimenting with making clones of every single one of them. There's a great Horus Heresy short story called Imperfect, wherein the entirety of the story is centered around Fulgrim and Ferris Manus playing a game of regicide together and having a rigorous debate on what loyalty really means and where their allegiances would fall if the people they put their faith in turned out to be tyrants. Now, at first, we as the audience believe this to be a prequel to the events on Istvan, where Fulgrim killed Ferris. But as the story goes on, and Fulgrim seemingly keeps trying to get his brother to switch sides, cracks begin to appear. At the end of the story, Fulgrim ends up killing his brother, and then the scene pans out to reveal in the surrounding room dozens of corpses of Ferris. What's really going on here is that Fulgrim had Fabius Bile create multiple clones of his deceased brother as he feels an enormous amount of guilt over murdering him and he needed to talk to him. There was still a lot left unsaid between the two. It's definitely a grimdark tale, but what happens in the brief epilogue we get is much more important, as we see Fabius descend into his laboratory, wherein he has 20 big incubation tanks containing fledgling infants of every single one of the Primarchs, some more malformed than others, but this is the very beginning of his experiments. Later on, we would get the novel Talon of Horus, which takes place thousands of years later. And in it, we learn that Fabius' cloning has taken another leap forward, as he ends up making a clone of Warmaster Horus. The resurrected Warmaster comes face to face with Abaddon and the infant Black Legion, and attempts to kill them. 
Abaddon and his followers managed to triumph over Horus, the despoiler proclaiming in the end that this wasn't his father. Now, it's possible that Horus allowed this to happen, we're not really sure, but for all intents and purposes, the clone was a mirror copy of the deceased Primarch, perfect in every way. But it was missing something, a certain essence. Now, normally when Space Marines encounter a Primarch, they basically have to exhort an enormous amount of mental energy to keep from immediately dropping to their knees and bowing before their gene sire. I'm over-exaggerating a bit, but they are designed at the genetic level to be subservient to them. This didn't happen here in this encounter. The members of this group felt nothing of the sort. Some more time would pass, and Fabius Bile would end up getting his own trilogy, and in it, he ends up making a perfect clone of Fulgrim. When the new Primarch is finally revealed to the corrupted Emperor's children, they are all completely blown away by what they're seeing, and demonstrate what was lacking with the Horus clone, dropping to their knees and fully pledging loyalty to him. Spoilers for the book, but Fabius ends up trading the perfect clone to Trazen because he sees what kind of damage could occur if the fractured Emperor's children were to be reunited once again. So even though this clone is currently locked up in one of Trazen's Tesseract vaults and probably will never see the light of day again, let's talk about what made it special. This clone had the thing that the Horus clone was lacking. Now, as it developed, it started to regain all of the original Fulgrim's memories and skills. But how did this occur if it was simply a clone? A clone doesn't have the memories of the individual that they're cloned from. Well, the common belief is that it wasn't just a clone of the physical body, but a clone of the Primarch's soul as well. This is, however, entering into theoretical territory as it's not specifically stated that that's what occurred in the book. But the theory does make a lot of sense, as the Primarchs are said to be a mixture of the physical and immaterial. They are created from the warp, thus their souls would have all of their memories. This theory makes sense on paper until you remember that the original old demonic Snake Man Fulgrim is very much still alive and active within the Eye of Terror, and definitely in possession of his own soul. Unless you buy into the theory that Fulgrim didn't actually banish the demon who had possessed him at Istvan and his soul is still trapped in that one painting, but we're going to table that for now in order to stay focused. I can understand why somebody would say this doesn't make sense. How can two bodies share the same soul at the same time? Well, I'm super happy you asked that question, my friend, because recently we've gotten a little bit more insight into that with Alpharius's Primarch novel. In this novel, we learn a lot about the Lord of the 20th Legion. First and foremost, he was the first Primarch to be discovered by the Emperor, and his existence was kept secret. He lived within the Imperial Palace, learning from the Emperor and Malkador, and wasn't revealed until the time was right. Additionally, the entire time he's developing, he feels this calling to another entity somewhere out in the galaxy. Like, there's something pulling at his soul. Now, this would be revealed to us later in the book that it was his twin brother Omegon. But here's the thing. The Emperor never created Omegon. He made 20 Primarchs, not 21. When they finally meet back up with each other, we learn that Omegon's origins trace back to the Scattering, the time when Chaos scooped up all of the infant Primarchs and scattered them across the galaxy. While Alpharius's pod was in the warp, his soul and body were split into two separate entities, one being that of Alpharius and the other being Omegon. They are not twins. They are not brothers. They are literally the same person and the same soul split in half. This is why when Alpharius was killed by Rogel Dorn, Omegon immediately knew what had happened. I bring this up to show that there is a precedent for a single soul to be split across multiple entities. So that very well may have been what occurred with the clone of Fulgrim, and why he wasn't just a physical copy of the Primarch, but a spiritual one as well. So through cloning, a deceased Primarch can definitely be brought back to life. We could even see something like a corrupted Primarch being reborn, complete with an uncorrupted copy of their soul. But what if we take cloning off the table? How would we then bring back a deceased Primarch? There's a common misconception about what happens when an individual dies in the Warhammer universe. Although it's true that they lose their anchor to the physical universe and thus are cut off from it, not all souls are immediately devoured by demons. This is especially true with particularly powerful souls of individuals with exceptionally strong wills. There is a chaos sorcerer within Lionel Johnson's new novel, Son of the Forest, that makes specific mention of how the soul of a Primarch is one of the most powerful entities that has ever been documented within the warp. This actually plays pretty prominently into his plots and schemes, so I won't spoil it here. But if you are interested, I did cover this in a different video. So I'll throw the link for that down in the description. But is that where the souls of all of the Primarchs currently are? Are they just floating around in the warp somewhere? Not necessarily. For one, we know that Horus's soul was completely obliterated in his battle against the Emperor. So as far as we know, he's gone gone. 
But what about the rest of them? Well, in the novel Black Legion, we're shown something pretty strange aboard the Vengeful Spirit, the late Horus's flagship now helmed by Abaddon the Despoiler. There are these weird psychic crystal growths that pop up all over the interior of the ship, each one bearing the appearance of an individual that lost their life within its walls. This was the setting for the final battle between Horus and the Emperor, where Horus and Sanguinius were both killed. Because of this, members of the Black Legion that roam the ship frequently come into contact with a crystalline copy of the Great Angel, but never Horus. Each one of these statues appears at random, never in the same place twice. In good old grimdark fashion, the text seems to imply that Sanguinius's soul is trapped within the ship. If this is the case, then we have actual documentation of a Primarch soul having a physical location. And with some warp-based shenanigans, it may be possible to resurrect them or reattach the soul to a clone. I should also briefly mention that some people claim that this isn't actually Sanguinius' soul at all, it's more of a warp echo of a particularly traumatic event. The text itself is admittedly rather vague, so the debate continues to rage on. But to me, if this was true, I believe we would also be seeing crystalline statues of Horus as well. But if a Primarch soul isn't trapped in some kind of crystalline structure or completely obliterated, can it be pulled out of the warp and resurrected? We did see Gilliman get resurrected, but he was in stasis and hadn't technically died yet. It's not quite the same thing as literally bringing someone back to life. However, although we haven't seen a Primarch resurrected in such a manner, we do have direct evidence that resurrection is indeed possible in this universe, as Erebus resurrected the blind prophet Cyrene Valention, also known as the Blessed Lady. He did this in order to manipulate Argol Tall, a marine of the Wordbearers who had a deep connection with her. When she comes back, she is definitely scarred, mentally, physically, emotionally, and spiritually, after the time she spent as a soul within the warp. But she comes back to life with no strings attached. And by the end of the book, we learn that the resurrection actually made her into one of the perpetuals. But to me, the biggest takeaway is that this chaos ritual was done by one of the most evil SOBs that has ever existed in this franchise. And for all intents and purposes, she wasn't corrupted. She hadn't become a pawn of chaos. Could such a dark ritual be used to resurrect one of the Primarchs? I believe it's definitely possible, but unlikely that that's the way Games Workshop will decide to go with it. And bringing back a dead Primarch would be kind of a big deal, and a simple, oh well, they got resurrected, would feel not so great. But what if there is no resurrection? What if there is no clone? What if the soul is intact and continues to exist in the warp? Could a Primarch return to the setting as a powerful spirit? Well, for that, we can turn to the Legion of the Damned. Although we don't really know what exactly they are, many Warhammer fans believe that they are the vengeful spirits of slain loyal marines, their souls once again given purpose by the God Emperor, and serve essentially as his demons of order. Many Warhammer fans also believe that the Legion of the Damned is currently being led by a giant headless Astartes, who may or may not be Ferris Manus. This theory comes from the fact that in Master of Mankind, the Emperor briefly summons his lost son and the spirits of those that were killed at the Dropsite Massacre to fight off against the demon Drachnian and his demonic forces. And if you were just reading the excerpt with no context, it would 100% sound like he summoned the Legion of the Damned. Jet black armor, wreathed in flames, spectral warriors, it's all there. And don't get me wrong, I absolutely love this idea. I love that the Legion of the Damned are a bunch of vengeful wraiths, led by the first Primarch to be killed during the Horus Heresy. But unfortunately, it seems to be just fan speculation. And trust me, I've spent the last four days frantically searching all over the internet, trying to find literally anything else that connects Ferris Manus with the Legion of the Damned, and it just doesn't exist. But if Games Workshop does decide to bring back a dead Primarch, specifically Ferris Manus, him leading the Legion of the Damned would be an amazing way to do that. Like, this entire video we've been talking about bringing a Primarch back as in literally resurrecting them, but having them come back as a vengeful spirit is kind of amazing. And the way that Games Workshop traditionally tells its stories and has them evolve over time is by seeding these little throwaway lines or tiny examples throughout their books that years later they can come back to and expand on. Even if this wasn't intentional when Master of Mankind was written, this exists as a perfect seed to not only bring back a vengeful Ferris Manus, but also expand on the Legion of the Damned in a very interesting way. It's a really cool theory, and I kind of secretly hope that Games Workshop does decide to do something with this, but as of right now, there's just not a lot linking Ferris Manus to the Legion of the Damned. 
What the Emperor summoned against Drachnion was just a one-off thing, but he did technically bring a Primarch back, it was just temporary. Now that 10,000 years have passed since the Horus Heresy and he's been growing stronger in the warp each and every day, there's no reason to believe that he couldn't do it again, and this time he may be able to make it permanent. But again, that's just me speculating, so take it with a grain of salt. So in conclusion, can the dead Primarchs come back to the setting? Yes, they absolutely can. Far crazier things have happened in Warhammer 40k, and as we discussed in this video, there are a lot of avenues open to GW in order to bring them back. But the most important question is, will they come back? Nobody can see the future, but as somebody who has been a fan of this franchise for two decades and has read over a hundred of the novels and more codexes and campaign books than I care to count, I firmly believe that yes, they absolutely will. But to elaborate on why, we need to take a step out of the lore and look at Warhammer first and foremost as a franchise. I don't think it should come as any surprise that the confirmed living Primarchs are returning to the setting right now, and that's because the wildly popular Horus Heresy series is about to officially end. As far as we know, there is only a single book left to release sometime later this year, and after that, it's over. And although it'll be great for fans to get some closure and a proper ending, it's not great for Games Workshop. I don't think I can stress to you just how huge the Horus Heresy is for them. Did you know that multiple Warhammer books have broken the barrier and gone semi-mainstream, landing on the New York Times bestseller list? Did you also know that literally every single one of them was a Horus Heresy book? Don't get me wrong, I'm sure the franchise is going to continue in some form or another, whether that take the form of a short-run sequel that covers up to the scouring, or we get some prequel books in the form of a Great Crusade series. But the Horus Heresy, by far Black Library's most popular series, is coming to an end. So what will Games Workshop do? Well, considering that the Primarchs are the soul of the series, it makes complete sense from a marketing perspective to import them into 40k to continue their story. Whether you like the implication or not, 40k is primed to turn into Horus Heresy 2.0 after all of the Primarchs inevitably return to the setting, and I would be willing to put money down that once all of the confirmed still alive Primarchs are back, they're going to turn to the dead ones. Is this a good thing for Warhammer 40k? Will their return completely overshadow all of the other amazing characters in this setting? Will it make Warhammer 40k less special and just another Horus Heresy? Or will they actually be able to pull it off? And will it make 40k better than it's been in years? I know personally I have mixed emotions on this, as seeing Sanguinius come back would be a truly epic, amazing moment that I would definitely fanboy over, but if I'm being realistic, a few years down the line after that initial excitement had worn off, it would probably end up cheapening the setting. This is supposed to be the grim dark future, and knowing that any prominent character can just be resurrected at any point seriously lessens the stakes. But I want to hear what you think. So let me know all of your thoughts about this down in the comment section below. The major takeaway is if there's money to be made on the table by bringing the dead Primarchs back, Games Workshop will absolutely do it. Whether it be through cloning, some form of dark ritual, or their souls reincarnating into a completely new spiritual entity, there's a million different ways they could go about this. Anyways, that's all I had for you on this topic. I haven't done one of these spitballing, me kind of thinking out loud videos in a while, so I figured it would be a nice change of pace. Big thanks to everyone who supports the work that I do, and I will catch you all in the next one.